Welcome to No More Bad Mondays. I'm Matt. And I'm David, here to share ways to get Microsoft 365 working for you. You're joining us on our step-by-step -step videos on using Teams for Everything, where we streamline the management and employee experience by using the Teams mobile app as a powerful hub. Bring as many operational functions as possible with an easy reach of every single employee. In this episode, we're looking at updates. So if your staff progress reports and checklists aren't being sent via the special Teams updates module, this is for you. It's going to help you get those updates submitted in a structured, scheduled and tracked way, all via the Teams app. Remember, if you find this useful, hit like and subscribe and head over to nomorebadmondays.com for courses, support, implementation plans, training materials and much, much more. Let's get started. Thanks for joining us again. So Teams updates. This is a feature in Teams that everyone is going to find a use for because they're a way of getting staff updates and checklists structured in terms of both content, who's submitting and receiving them, and the schedule for submission. Perhaps most importantly, you can get these submitted through the Teams mobile app. So phone, tablet, PC, whatever's convenient meaning that it's within reach of every single employee. So what we're looking to do is replace paper checklists, email updates, forms used to provide updates, you get the idea, and we're going to do this for every member of staff, whether they are office workers, remote workers, or even if they typically never use a screen during their working day. Okay, let's take a look at an example. This is an accident report, so we've got a mixture of dates, we have multi-select checkboxes, single select radio buttons, free text fields, and the extremely useful ability to attach an image or take a photo or video from within the Teams app itself. And of course, any submission has the user who submitted it and the date time of submission, so there's a great audit trail. Now, when this update is submitted, it can go to any number of defined people. So in this case, it might go to your health and safety person, but also to any relevant managers, all of whom can get notified via the Teams app. So you can imagine structuring just about any kind of report or update using this process. And remember, if it's a regular update, you can set a schedule so the person submitting it is reminded that it's due. OK, let's dive in and see how to set these up. Right, so here we are within the Teams app on the PC, although you could be looking at this within a browser on your computer. And what we want to do is we want to go into the Updates app. Now, within the Updates app, there are three choices at the top. You've got Submit, Review and Manage. Quite self-explanatory. Submit is where you would go to submit an update if you wanted to do it via the PC rather than on your mobile device. Review is where you can go and have a look at those updates that have been submitted to you for review. Again, that can be also be done on the mobile app. And finally, there's Manage. And Manage is where you can create a new template for your updates. So if we click on Manage, and let's start from blank. Now you can use a template, um, and there are a number of different examples. I tend not to because they're so quick to make, um, I don't really find any need for it. So the first thing you're asked to do is, is to provide a, re a, a request title. For this, we're going to call it Incident Report. Click Next. And then we're going to start adding questions. Now, if you use um, forms on 365, this will all look very, very familiar because it is extremely, well, it uses the same technology. The only difference is that you don't have access to the same kind of branching um, that you do have in, in, in forms. Um, anyway, let's, let's create some questions. So if we add a question, we'll go through each data type um, in order. As you can see, there are a number of different data types and I'll just show you how those look on your update form. So here, let's um, call this incident title. So this is short text, you don't format it. Um, if you wanted to um, give a bit of explanation as to, to, to what this is or what this field is for, you can subtitle it. So um, short disc 
description. Let's say. If it's required, which it is, you click this button here, and that means that the update cannot be submitted until this, this field has been filled. Okay, our next question then, um, we're going to choose next data type, and that's rich text. Now, rich text, of course, allows you to use bold and italics and underline. So this is this is much better for um, asking for a, a a bigger description of a particular thing. So if we say, um, if we just call this description of incident, and then we say, please provide full details, then um, we'll say, yes, we require that as well. And we'll add another question now after this. So the next data type we've got is number. So this um, might be um, how many people were involved. And here you've got um, the opportunity to have a restriction. So you can actually say, well, the number has to be greater than or less than or between two particular values. Um, so that may be useful in some situations. We won't have any, that here though. Next question we're going to do is going to be a um, multiple choice. Now, a multiple choice um, is where you've got uh, a question that might have more than one answer. So say, for example, in this incident, um, and we're asking who was involved, and then we might have um, employee, employee and customer. Well, of course, with an incident, that may actually um, involve both of those. So in that sense, you could say, well, actually, I need to be able to choose both employee and customer or just employee or just customer. The next data type is the single choice. Now, the single choice would be where there can only be one answer. So say, for example, in the case of an incident, if we have um, a site and we've got um, site one and site two, well, the incident can't happen at both sites. It has to happen at one or other. Similarly, um, if you wanted a drop down, you could do it as a drop down. On, on this um, single choice one, it, it lists every individual choice. So if you've got a lot of choices, uh, it might be that you would choose a drop down um, where people are just going to click on the drop down and, and they will be able to choose from a much larger list. You really choose one or other dependent on what your form looks like and how big your list is. But they do perform essentially the same purpose. The final one then is date. Now, date, there's something to be aware of with date. Now, um, for this one, we'll call it when did it happen? And um, you, you will get a calendar control. Uh, when someone completes a form, they get a calendar control and they will choose the date um, that's appropriate for the incident. However, it's, it is just a date. It's not a date time field. So what you do need to do, if, if there's a specific time that you want to collect, then you'll need to really collect it as a short text so that somebody can say, well, actually, you know, it, it happened at three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, 3 p.m., 4 p.m., whatever. Um, you could do it as a number. Um, but if you did it as a number, then you'd be constraining them to use the um, 24 hour clock, I guess. Um, so those are the different question types that you've got. So as you can see, creating your actual update questions is really, really simple. It's just a question of typing in what the question is and then identifying a data type and whether the whether the, an answer is required. And in some cases, whether there are um, particular values that relate to that answer that people can choose from. Now, when you've actually got a particular item and you've created a question, you may want to rejig it and you may want to move it up, down, or, or in fact, copy that question. And you do that by simply clicking on the question and then it opens up these particular items here. These allow you to move questions up and down. Um, you can add questions between, you can copy 
and you can delete questions. So when you're happy and you've got all your questions in there, you've got the right data types, you've got them in the order that you want them to be, um, then you're now in a situation where you can move on to the next stage. Click next at the top and you get to define the workflow settings. So in the workflow settings, you've got a few important decisions to make. First and foremost, who is going to submit um, the update? Are you going to constrain it so only specific people in the organisation can submit it? Or are you going to allow anybody with the link to submit it? Now, I tend to use this this second one, which allows anybody in the organization with the link to submit. And the reason for that is that if, for example, you've got someone who would typically do an update, but they're not able to because they're off sick or whatever, then someone else may need to submit that update on their behalf. And you're not gonna to want to go into these workflow settings to identify that other person just so that they can submit that one-off update. However, there's a drawback. Here, if you, if you say anyone with the link can submit it, there is no opportunity um, to specify a schedule. Whereas if you identify an individual, you have this option to set a schedule for submission. So they get a reminder in Teams to say, well, actually, this is when your update is due. So your choice really is whether you maintain a list of people who are expected to um, submit the update or and then if they are not available to submit that update and you expect someone else to do it then you'd need to go in and change these workflow settings or alternatively you allow anybody in the organization with the link to submit the update but then of course you don't have the um, reminder or the prompt to the person who would normally submit it to make them submit it okay so so that's a decision there the second piece of data that i need to put in is who is going to receive the update. So here you just type in um, the name and it will pick up an appropriate person from the directory. You can have multiple people here and um, all of those people will get a notification via Teams that an update has been submitted. You can identify whether a file attachment is required um, and the decisions you might make with regards to that would be based on the actual update. So in, an in, in the case of an incident report, it might be very desirable that they, uh, that they include a photo or a video. But what if they don't have the ability to for whatever reason or there isn't anything that they feel that they can attach? You wouldn't want to prohibit them submitting an incident report simply because they haven't got a video. So I might leave this off in this instance, but I guess you know, there might be opportunities where you would want that that turned on. The second one is about whether the update um, can be edited. Now, this really depends again on what the update is. If it were an update that had a more um, rule based purpose. So say, for example, it had something to do with health and safety or food safety um, or where date and time was very important, then you may not want that to be editable. Okay, so once you've completed this, you simply click save and then the update is will be live. So what about reviewing updates? Well, you can view updates in two different places, either on the mobile app or you can or, or you can review it on the PC app or in the browser. Um, and you do it by uh, clicking on the second of the three options at the top, which is review. And here it will give you details of all of those um, updates that have been received, together with statistics if they're scheduled uh, on submission rate, etc. Well, I hope this has shown you just how powerful and easy to set up Teams updates are. Now, one final thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this. When you start using updates widely, particularly for regular checklists, you'll discover it's almost as much of a chore reviewing each update, looking for issues, as it was checking the original source. Well, we have a solution for you. Check out our Teams Updates Intelligent Chat Notifications course at nomorebadmondays.com, where we have a power automate flow that identifies if any problems or issues have been reported in any update and it posts just those issues to a group chat. Now this might be useful in three ways. It would act as a double check to make sure nothing has been missed because an update hasn't been reviewed. 
it might prompt a reviewer to check a submitted update faster if they know it contains an issue. And finally, we might use it as a manager to give us a heads up of any issues lower down the line, even if it comes from an update that we would not normally be checking. If this sounds useful, head over to nomorebadmondays.com where you'll find the course complete with a download of the flow for you to install in your 365 environment and a full video walkthrough of exactly how each function and action within the flow works. Thank <laughs> you.